and it's approaching or a little after 6.30. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you for being here tonight. Good evening. Um, I know that this is the week after spring break, so we're jumping back into that routine. Appreciate you taking your Tuesday night to be with us. Um, so attending tonight's Parent University, it's a new series of topics that we use to promote parent, school, and community engagement. We want to offer these series to promote, support, and bring awareness um, to our parents, to our district, but also advocate for our students' success. That's ultimately our goal here in the district. My name is Angie Ross, and my partner in crime, or should I say colleague, Denny Morrison, we are your family and community engagement coordinators. So our goal is to advocate for that student's success, to provide these events for you tonight. Um, in doing so, we want not just the parents' engagement, but also the community partnerships as those events transpire, as they grow. Um, partnerships, excuse me, partnerships such as Wilson Health, which leads me to our presenter and our topic for tonight. Katie Rosenbeck, she is dual certified a pediatric nurse practitioner and a pediatric mental health specialist with Wilson Health Medical Group Pediatrics. She is going to address mental health in children in grades K through 8 and the rules their family has in supporting their mental health. I know I have two youngsters, I have a kindergartner and a third grader, and um, I joke saying they have my sarcasm, my humor, but how they channel that, how they are with their friends, what they're learning, the environment that they're in, the maybe the traumatic um, experiences that they have issued with or, um, experience with COVID. I, I don't know what they're going through besides asking them the questions and helping to support them in, in what they're getting, what they're growing into. And hopefully Katie here can help guide that because it's a new world and um, our kiddos are going through some things that as parents we don't even know about and how they handle that, how they can grow from it. So, and of course our partnership with Wilson Health, can't thank them enough. So thank you for being here and uh, the floor is yours. Very good. All right, well, I'm excited to be here with you guys today and I thank Angie and Denny for having me out. Um, again, like Angie said, I am a nurse practitioner here at Wilson, also have um, an extra certification in pediatric mental health. Um, I've been with Wilson now for about a year and a half, um, and originally a little bit about me, I'm from not too far away from Maria Stein, graduated from Marion Local, um, went to Ohio State for my college of nursing education, and I'm excited to be back in the community um, taking care of your kiddos um, and a lot of kiddos of the community. So again, um, I have a two-year-old of my own um, who knows how to push my buttons every day and test my knowledge about kids every day. Um, and my husband, Zach, is a high school math teacher, so he's dealing with kiddos every day too. So um, again, just happy to be here with you guys. And essentially what I'm gonna do today, I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the mental health conditions that we're treating in our office. Things that you guys are seeing um, at home with your kids or that you're curious about or heard about or wondered, is my kid dealing with this? Um, and just kind of what does this stuff look like, what we may do to help at home whenever we have a concern, um, and some other tidbits, tips, tricks, things that we can implement in our homes to hopefully help, um, strategize, help with the strategies and dealing with mental health moving forward. So this is a graph from the CDC um, showing the percentage of kids with depression, anxiety, and behavior disorders kind of broken up into age groups. Um, you can see three to five, six to 11, 12 to 17. Anxiety is a big one kind of across all age groups. Um, depression and anxiety, obviously, in the older age groups. But honestly, what I take away from this graph is that we need to know what to look for in throughout all aspects and all ages. From toddlers until adulthood, when we turn 18, kids can suffer from anxiety, they can suffer from depression, they can have impulsivity, um, anger, irritability, um, ADHD, all kinds of things, ODD, conduct disorders, throughout all spectrum. So it's not when we think of anxiety and depression, we may think of an older adolescent. Um, but our younger kids can, are struggling too, and we're seeing that here in your community. We're seeing that at our office as well. Um, so again, yes, this is kind of a representation of maybe some of the most common and where we see things. But again, just be aware that we need to start 
um, surveying our kids, we need to start looking for mental health concerns and disorders and even our youngest kiddos um, in that three to five age group. So these are um, some of the disorders I'm gonna be talking about more specifically tonight, anxiety, depression, attention disorders, and oppositional defiant disorder, okay? Um, I'm gonna start with oppositional defiant disorder. Um, when I talk about oppositional defiant disorder, this goes above and beyond your temper tantrums, right? This goes above and beyond your kiddos. Kiddos developmentally are made to figure out how far can I go? I need to push mom's buttons. I wanna see you know, where, where I stand in kind of a hierarchy in my family. Um, you know, what can I get away with? What can't I get away with? Oppositional defiant disorder is kind of going above and beyond what is considered a norm for a specific age group or a developmental, um, developmental stage. Um, according to the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, um, as much as one in, or 16 percent of all school-aged children um, in adolescents can have a diagnosis of oppositional defiant disorder. Um, Again, it's characterized by marked irritability, anger, uncooperative and defiant behaviors um, that goes noticeably above and beyond that of a normal developmental age group, more than just the tam temper tantrums and talking back. Um, you can see up here some of the common symptoms. Frequent temper tantrums, they're happening all the time, constantly. We are excessively angry or arguing with adults. Um, we're often questioning rules. Why does this rule apply to me or this rule doesn't apply to me? Um, that's a, a big one. We're actively defying. We don't really care what the rules are. We don't think they apply to me, and I'm going to let you know about that. Um, we deliberately want to annoy or try to annoy kids our age, adults, teachers, our loved ones. Um, we want to be kind of, we want to poke the bear, we want to press those buttons. Um, we're frequently having anger or resentment. You don't love me, you don't care about me, you're putting this rule in place because you hate me. Um, and meanful and hateful talking whenever we're upset. We can see, and I think one of the key things I want you to remember is not a lot of these signs and symptoms are going to be seen in oppositional defiant disorder, anxiety, depression, ADHD. Not every kid is just going to have one thing that may be happening to them. We have a lot of comorbid conditions when it comes to mental health. I always say with a parent who's frustrated, um, we're trying to get some answers, it would be really easy if we could swap your nose or draw your blood and say this is what's going on, right? We can't do those things. We have to have really in-depth conversations. We need to figure out what happened in your past, what's going to happen in you know, your future, what are we worried about. There's all kinds of things that we kind of have to tease through to figure out what the best course of treatment will be for you. But my goal today is for you to figure out, see some of these things that, hey, this might be what my kid is dealing with, and then take that somewhere. Um, and hopefully with this presentation, we'll kind of know where to go. So the next thing I'm going to talk about is attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Um, when we think of ADD or ADHD, typically we see two different spectrums. Um, so we can have the inattentive side, we can have the hyperactive side, and then we can have a combination of the two, okay? Um, it's important, again, to remember that what we see in ADHD, we may see in anxiety or vice versa. Um, kiddos with ADHD, the way we diagnose ADHD is we need to see deficits in two areas of life. In kids, in our population, typically that means at home and that means at school. Um, those are the big places that we're looking at. So usually we're not gonna turn it on and turn it off um, at one place or the other. Usually we're gonna notice at some way, some kind of issue in two different areas of life. Um, and when we think about inattention, these kiddos are super easily distracted. They have a hard time in big groups. When kids are around them doing their projects, if somebody's humming, that may really pull that other kiddo's attention um, who has an ADD. Um, they appear forgetful. They're unable to complete those multi-test um, step tasks. A lot of kids can be forgetful, right? Um, but this is something that kind of, again, goes above and beyond the norm. You tell your kid, go upstairs, pick up your room, bring down those dirty dishes, um, and then we're going to go do X, Y, Z. Your kid may get upstairs, forget while they're there, see their cool toy on their bed and start playing with it, right? And then the dishes are still upstairs and we have to go up and remind them constantly, what are you up here for? Why did I send you here, right? Um, so we have to constantly tell them 
just one step direction so they can get there, then the second direction so they can check that box, then the third direction. These kids often need recurrent reminders. Um, again, with the fourth throw, follow through, they get very easily distracted. Homework, they may get a couple problems done and then they're off to doing something else um, or with chores. These kids can look very unorganized. Their book bags are hot messes. You open the zipper and things are flying everywhere. Their lockers are a disaster. Um, you know, they may not have their folders organized like some of the other kiddos. May. They may not know where their homework is. They actually are literally losing their homework in their messy lockers. Um, they forget what was assigned that day. Their organizational skills are pretty poor. And they like to avoid things that call, that you need a lot of concentration to complete well, right? So they may do really good in school when they love a subject and they're really good at it, but then something gets a little bit harder and they are just, it's too much. It's too much for them to kind of comprehend. So they may do really well at the beginning of the year and then all of a sudden, you know, we start to have a struggle again. These kids have poor attention to detail and they might, may not seem to be listening to you when spoken to. Um, they kind of have that like, where are you? Are you in there? Are you hearing me? Um, but again, their brain may be somewhere else. The hyperactivity aspect of ADHD, so again, you can have both, um, but the hyperactive kids are those ones that wake up and they are on the go and they don't stop until they go to bed, okay? These kids are driven by a motor, we're moving, 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 moving. They may be the ones that are a little bit more fidgety in class, we're a distraction to other kids because we can't sit still, we're always kind of picking or playing or messing. Um, we're blurting out answers because we're super excited, we have a hard time waiting our turn or we're talking excessively. These symptoms on their own, you have kids, your kid has checked one or multiple of these boxes, right? Um, when we think about ADHD as a disorder, we're talking about when these symptoms collectively are causing us um, having issues succeeding in school or with friends or building relationships um, with things that we need to get done at home. The next thing I'm going to talk about um, is anxiety. Um, the first thing to remember with anxiety is anxiety kind of makes the world go round, right? There's normal anxiety, there's abnormal anxiety. Was I a little anxious getting up and talking in front of a group of people today? Absolutely, right? But I was still able to function, get my power work done. I'm here hopefully doing okay, right? Um, but anxiety, and when I talk to kids about anxiety in my office, I'm saying anxiety gets me out of bed on time to make it to work by eight o'clock, right? Not by 8.15. Anxiety makes me, oh, I shouldn't buy that other thing on Amazon that I don't need, like the million other things I get on Amazon, right? Because I need money to pay my bills. Anxiety can, helps us to function in a day-to-day -day way, and that's functional anxiety, right? That is something that is kind of benefiting us really as a whole. Um, when we start to think about anxiety as a clinical diagnosis, we're thinking about anxiety that is just kind of inhibiting our ability to succeed. It's inhibiting our ability to do well in school. It's inhibiting our ability to have appropriate relationships or make friends. Um, it, can, it can be a detriment to some family dynamics too. Um, so there's, this is just kind of a list of the, of the common anxiety disorders that we would treat in primary care and what you may be seeing at home. Um, there's several other things, more severe um, anxiety kind of subcategories, but um, the three I'm gonna talk about today, generalized anxiety disorder, this is kind of what it sounds like, right? In a general aspect, in a general way, um, we are just overall very anxious, nervous, worried about a lot of things. Sometimes we can't even put our finger on what it is. Um, the worry is very difficult to control, and again, it's inhibiting our ability to succeed. Um, it may not be surrounded one particular thing, person scenario, um, but we are noticing that is it causing a negative effect on our ability to get good grades or build relationships um, or have discussions. Separation anxiety disorder, when we think about separation anxiety disorder, at least in my brain, I think of toddlers, right? We just don't want to leave their moms. Um, but separation anxiety disorder, again, goes across the lifespan. Adults can have separation anxiety disorder. Um, and this is really excessive fear surrounding leaving a loved one. Um, so a lot of times it's that kind of that one person that's that core person in your life. So mom is a common one, dad is a common one, a grandma or grandparent especially after the loss of mom and dad, then you have grandma and grandpa and we just don't want to leave them. Um, 
So we worry about losing the love that one poor person, that loved one frequently, kind of rationally or irrationally. Um, we don't want to leave that person. Um, we have excessive worry we might be separated from a loved one. Um, I see a lot of kiddos who come into my office whose parents think that they have ADHD, but really, um, there's some component of separation anxiety that's happening when I talk to the kiddo and I say, okay, you're having a hard time paying attention in school. What are we thinking about? When you're supposed to be doing your math homework, what are we thinking about otherwise? Well, mom told me that she was going to da 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 da, da today, or I was worried that mom, you know, she went, and went to search for a job, and you know, there's all kinds of things that these kiddos are worrying about, and there's all kinds of things out in the world right now that these kiddos are seeing and thinking, and they can present as, again, inattention, but really, I'm worried about this, I'm worried about this, I'm worried about this, I want to be at home with mom because I'm worried about her. Um, so separation anxiety disorder, we're seeing this in a lot of our kiddos. It's not just the toddlers. Um, we can see it again throughout the lifespan. We can see it in adults, too. Um, and then social anxiety disorder, when we think about this, we think about um, the kiddos who have an extreme and immense fear of surrounding social situations. And it's, the fear is just above and beyond what the actual threat is. Um, so these kids do not, will not, do not want to stand in front of a group of people, especially their peers. They're worried constantly about what somebody's thinking about um, them. They're worried about judgment. Um, they're worried that, you know, somebody looks at you and then goes and talks to somebody else and this kid says, oh my gosh, they're talking about me. They're always kind of worried um, and avoiding social situations and social settings. They don't want to go to dances. They don't want to go to games. They'd rather be at home by themselves. Um, and again, it's that disproportionate anxiety. The fear is really greater than what that threat is. When, when we think until we talk about anxiety, we can truly have physical ailments that um, are expressed when we are anxious. Kiddos are not, when we're anxious and we want to avoid something, right, whether social or separation anxiety, we don't want to go to school because I am so anxious about it. It's different than your kiddo that doesn't want to go to bed, right? I'm thirsty, I'm hungry, I need to go to the bathroom, right? They have all of those excuses. These kids quite literally will give themselves, I shouldn't even say give themselves, these kids will experience extreme headaches. They will have nausea. They can make, they can have nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, fast heart rates. Um, they can really like have tremors. You know, anxious kid, you may notice their hands are always shaking, their legs are always tapping, they're kind of moving all the time. You can have high blood pressure, you can have muscle tension, they can hyperventilate, um, really having a hard time falling asleep, staying asleep, um, and then we're super fatigued the next day. We can feel weak or dizzy, lightheaded, we can feel short of breath. Um, sometimes people come in with complaints of asthma or concern for asthma when really these kiddos are having panic attack or anxiety attacks. It has nothing to do with wheezing or respiratory function, but more related to anxiety and nervousness. Um, so, and they're not making these things up. They are feeling these things. They are truly so anxious that they are having these physical symptoms. Um, these are some of the behaviors that you may notice. Um, quiet noises, we're always biting our nails, um, where we want to avoid things, we're crying out of nowhere. Um, we're always kind of feeling, you know how you have that feeling sometimes someone's up looking for me, I'm a little, you're running out of, I run out of my basement, so I think it's creepy, right, because something's back there. These kids are always kind of, they may always feel on edge, like something is kind of, somebody's talking about me, somebody's thinking about me, um, you know, they kind of always have that tense stuff feeling. And in the younger age group, we may notice regression. So we were potty trained and then successfully potty trained for a long time and all of a sudden we're not, we're having accidents. Um, same thing with like pacifiers. We have went a year without a pacifier, we have a baby and now we want a pacifier again. Um, regression is a pretty pretty common thing, especially in that kind of younger toddler age group. Um, and then they always have these kind of what if thoughts. We're constantly thinking something bad will happen. We have unreasonable thinking, you know, things that really don't make sense. Where did that come from, right? Why are you even thinking about that? We haven't talked about that vacation for six months and now all of a sudden you're worried about the plane right there. Like all of those things where these thoughts have kind of come out of nowhere um, and they're pretty unreasonable or irrational at times. When we think about um, anxiety, we also see a comorbidity with depression. Depression and anxiety are very, very common. Um, 
Common features of depressive disorders, as you can read, are the presence of sad, empty, or irritable mood. Um, this may be associated with somatic or body or feeling them and cause cognitive changes that interfere with functioning at home, in school, or with peers. Um, we can see frequent illnesses, we can see abdominal pain, headaches, just like we did with anxiety. Um, we used to love going to school. We were a straight A student, and now all of a sudden, getting to school is a fight every day. Um, we now have frequent absences. We were, um, you know, on the volleyball team and we loved it. And now getting to volleyball practice is really hard. Dance, going out with friends. We wanted to play outside and now I just want to sit in my room. Um, the social isolation, these kids who are suffering from depression often just want to be left alone. Will you please leave me alone? I just want to sit in my room. I want the door shut. I don't want you to bother me. Um, those are pretty common um, findings with depression. When we think about true clinical depression, we're noticing um, as when you think of DSM-5 criteria, typically symptoms are lasting for greater than six months, and it's really associated with a marked change in our mood and our behavior. We're feeling sad more days than not. We're feeling down more days than not. Sometimes kids explain it to me as feeling gray. I don't feel happy really ever. I'm not necessarily like super sad all the time. I just like don't enjoy things anymore. So kind of if you picture it that way, they just kind of feel gray and they're living in this gray in the middle, um, just kind of going through their day without much drive or enjoyment. Again, as we talked um, previously or showed you in the graph, toddlers and preschoolers can have clinical depression, which is crazy to think about. Um, but anywhere as young as three to five, there was even you know symptoms in infancy, which is just a crazy kind of thing to wrap our, hand, our brains around. Um, but these are some kind of symptoms that we may see for age group. Um, sadness, sadness, hopelessness, self-hatred, withdrawn, anhedonia is a big word where it just means we have lost the pleasurable things that we used to enjoy before, right? So we we were the kid that loved that was outgoing. We loved to play with our friends. We loved to go to basketball and football games. We played on the volleyball or basketball team. Um, and now we just don't want anything to do with any of those things. Or we go and we don't enjoy it. Um, or it's a fight to get you there. Um, and then you can see too with toddlers, very similar to symptoms of anxiety, right? Um, regression, temper tantrums, irritability feeling kind of sad, just picturing someone living in gray, are you living in gray? We don't have a lot of enjoyment um, and we can be acting out. Sleep sleep and appetite are another big ones that may or may not be on this slide, um, but you can see a change in appetite either one way or the other, right? Now we are noticing like lots of weight gain because we're eating excessively or we don't want to eat at all and we have weight loss. Um, or we have kind of change in diet. Um, and then sleep can be an issue too, where we are either sleeping all the time, like I just don't have energy, I just feel blah all the time, um, or we don't sleep at all. I can't sleep, I can't turn my brain off. You know, I'm up at all hours of the night um, on my phones, on my screens, um, those kinds of things. So sleep is a big one with depression. And when we talk about depression, um, we have to talk about suicide. Um, suicide is big and scary and we don't like to talk about it, but it's really important that we have these conversations with our kids. I think what the first thing that I want to make aware is asking your child about suicide is not going to increase their risk of suicide. Um, we need to make sure that they're aware that we love them and that we care about them and that we want to know what they're thinking. And if there's a way that we can help, ask them. Say, can I help you? Um, you know, it's as simple as that, but we really do, if we're worried about depression and you have a kiddo who's talking about suicide, we need to make sure that we take them seriously um, and that we need to make sure that this isn't something that we just blow off. Even if they're saying it out of anger, a lot of kids are going to, especially when I come, they come to my office and we talk to them, my kiddo says, um, you got in a big fight with mom and dad, they said, I am just going to go kill myself, you don't love me anymore. That, ha that conversation has happened many, 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 many times and replayed in my office. And the kiddo in most, in a lot of circumstances says, I was just mad. I don't have a plan. I don't want to kill myself, right? But if those conversations are happening in your home, that's something that we need to address, okay? We don't just blow that off and say, oh, they don't mean it because we don't know if it ever gets to the point where they do mean it um, if we don't kind of have a conversation about it. Okay, um, statistics about suicide, 
Girls, it's more commonly attempted in girls. It tends to be less successful in girls. Like if a boy says has a plan to commit suicide, it's usually a pretty lethal plan. Um, so that's why boys tend to be kind of more successful, if you want to call it that. Um, older teen males, again, higher incidence because, again, usually more lethal. Um, in 2020, um, according to the CDC, suicide was the second leading cause of death for people in the 10 to 14 and 25 to 34 age group. It's the third leading cause of death in like adolescence, so if you would do that 15 to 25 age group. So it is prevalent, and it's something that we need to be aware of and we need to know how to talk about. Um, when we think about anxiety and depression, obviously, we also think about suicide, as I've said, and some of the, the risk factors that may put somebody at a higher risk for suicide. The number one predictor is hopelessness, meaning that all of a sudden, all of my prized possessions mean nothing to me anymore. Um, I'm giving, this is something that nobody was ever allowed to touch, and I threw it away at my, bro my brother and said, fine, whatever, play with it, I don't care. Or I'm giving things away to my friends. Um, we can see a sudden change in mood. Um, somebody who's decided that I'm going to commit suicide, sometimes it's planned out, right? And sometimes they have a plan and now we have a change in a mood because we actually have something that we're kind of looking forward to, I guess, in a way. And we can see a sudden upswing of mood because we know that there's a plan in, board, in place. Um, they may be thinking about death or talking about death, writing about death, journaling about death all the time. Um, and then something else that is kind of a, a risk factor or predictor, if you have like a major life change, a major illness, a, a death of a loved one, um, something that kind of rocks your world. Um, because when we're a teenager or even younger, things that rock our world may not be as big as some of the things that when we get to an adult, um, you know, it could be a lot smaller. So we need to pay attention and make sense and make sure that we're being aware that things that may not be that big of a deal to us, it probably was a big deal to us when we were a teenager. So kind of make sure, kind of think about it that way too. And then these are other risk factors and predictors of suicide as well. History of any kind of abuse, um, history of self-harm or previous suicidal attempt. Um, again, depression increases our risk, sudden changes in mood, alcohol and drug abuse, um, a serious medical illness, the child being diagnosed with a serious medical illness or a loved one being diagnosed with a serious medical illness. Um, and then if you would come into my office and we have a kid who has suicidal ideation, I will always every time talk about suicidal plan. Do you have a plan to hurt or kill yourself is a question that I have asked over and over and over again. The kiddos that have a plan are thinking about it way more often. Um, there may be kiddos out there who have suicidal ideation who really aren't at a greater a risk for suicide. Um, but if you have a suicidal plan, there's something going on and we really need to make an intervention. Um, one of the other statistics that I read when preparing for this, um, one in five youth has serious, one in five youth has seriously considered committing suicide, um, and one in six youth has made a suicidal plan. So that's that's a lot of kids. That's a lot of kids. This is kind of a mnemonic of is path norm. It's kind of a weird saying, right? But it's kind of telling us different um, risk factors in, for suicide um, to assess suicide risk. So this is a question that we may ask, again, are you talking, do you have suicidal ideation? Are you talking to, about harming and threatening yourself? Do you have a plan? Um, are they having, using any kind of substances, illicit substances, drinking alcohol, smoking marijuana, um, feeling a purpose, purpose, purposelessness. I practiced that word so many times that I just botched it again. But this is just, we feel like we have no place in the world, right? I have no point, there's no point for me to be here because X, Y, Z. Um, our teenagers feel this way sometimes, okay? Anxiety, feeling trapped like there's no way out of a bad situation. We made a, a bad, we had a bad plan or we made a bad um, move and now we feel trapped. This is kind of scary in these teenage boys too because sometimes we can't see past that one bad decision that we're just gonna get in a whole lot of trouble for, and they can make more rash decisions, typically. Um, if we're withdrawn from friends, family, and society, we're removing ourselves from all of these places, we're feeling anger, we're having more recklessness than we weren't this way before, and again, new changes. So when we talk about COVID, no matter your thoughts on it, no matter you know how it has affected you, what the takeaway is, is it has affected you and it has affected your kids in some way or the other. 
It's changed the way that school was ran for a couple years. Some kids are still feeling behind because of the way that um, you know school was. We everybody tried their best, right? Teachers worked really hard. I know my husband was downstairs FaceTiming. You know, it's just it was a crazy couple of years, and things aren't back to the way that they were or will be, I don't know. Um, but I think what's important is that we need to realize it's made an impact and there has been, um, especially on our kids' mental health, changes in sports seasons, um, sports seasons that were canceled. Um, again, some people feel behind academically, we feel more anxiety. Um, there's lots of things out there in the world, we don't know what's true, we don't know what's false, um, and then we can kind of have this, like we don't know how to to sort through some of those things. Me as an adult, I don't know how to sort through some of the things that I hear even still, right? Um, but what we do need to realize is that we have definitely seen an uptick in mental and behavioral health disorder since the onset of COVID. We have seen an increase in anxiety. Um, we have seen an increase in suicidal ideation. This is a graph from the CDC. It's just showing um, suicide visit rates for suicidal ideation in EDs. Um, in 2019, 2020, and 2021. So the little dots, that's 2019, 2020 is the little lines, and then 2021, um, and this isn't teenage girls specifically, teenage boys had a little bit of an increase, but not as much as the teenage girls. Um, but you can see that the visits for suicidal ideation specifically into the emergency, into the emergency rooms had increased significantly. So as much as 51% increase, um, in actual suicide attempts in ages 12 to 17 in girls. This does say this did decrease some, um, but then it kind of jumped again. So in 2019, it was, you know, here in 2020, it actually went down a little bit, and then in 2021, it bopped up 51% from where it was in 2019. Um, what I want you to know is suicide can be preventable if we know what to look for. Um, you know, we, and sometimes we just don't know and we don't realize the signs that are kind of being thrown our way because they can be very, very subtle. Um, but, and suicide is hard for everybody. So if you, again, have a concern, I just want you to never just kind of put that behind you, right? Like, I oh, don't know, I'm being crazy. If you have a concern, we need to say something, okay? Because if you're wrong, great. But if you're right, then we can make a change um, or we can perform an intervention or try to do something to help. All right, so how do we talk mental health with our kids? Talking to our kids sometimes, right? I don't have a teenager at home, but I was a teenager and I was not an easy one to talk to. My mother and I, we had our hands around the kitchen table, that's for sure. Um, so how, how do we effectively talk to our kids about mental health? Um, I think what's important is just kind of creating a culture in your home where talking about these things is an expectation. So even if you have no concerns, bring it up every once in a while. How are you doing? You know, I know that this happened in school or I've heard about this. How do you feel about COVID right now? X, Y, Z. Making that just kind of a regular conversation in your home, whether or not you have a concern about your particular child. Um, again, asking about suicide and your kid is not going to increase their risk or their rate of suicide, okay? We need to have that conversation. Um, what's going, we wanna make sure that we're open and honest with our kid. If we do have a concern, don't just kind of walk around it, right? We need to make sure that we address it. We say it out loud. I'm worried about your mental health. Don't do this at a restaurant. Don't do this with her friends over. Don't do this, you know, with family over. Don't do this around brothers and sisters, okay? Some, we get embarrassed sometimes about our mental health. There's a stigma there. There shouldn't be, you know, if we had strep throat, we get take an antibiotic. If we have diabetes, we take the steps to treat it. The same thing with our mental health. Sometimes it's situational, sometimes it's genetics. Um, so we need to make sure that if we had cough, cold, congestion, wheezing, we're gonna ask our kid about it. How are you feeling, right? We need to do the same thing about our mental health, okay? Make it a norm. And we want to speak at an appropriate level for your kiddo. Don't come at a teenager and talk like a toddler, right? It's like you're talking to a toddler, don't talk to a toddler like you're talking to a teenager. Um, you know, be upfront, be open, be honest, try to communicate at their level and things that make sense to them. You know, talking to your, your toddler, do you, are, are you depressed? They're gonna say, I don't know, because I don't know what that is, right? Are you feeling anxious? 
No. When you talk to your toddler, do you feel sad? I see you crying a lot. What, what are you crying about? I'm worried about you crying so much. Um, you know, do you feel nervous or do you feel worried? Um, you know, those are better words, which I'm sure you all know, but sometimes we don't think about these things whenever we have our own kind of anxiety about our kids. Um, make sure you're watching your child's response to your discussion. Sometimes we need to stop, right? Sometimes the conversation is just going to not go where we want it to go. They shut off, they're not listening anymore, we've talked too long, or now they're angry, mad, irritable, and then it turns into a big fight. Sometimes we need to allow our kids to cool off, say, do you know what, let me give you a half an hour, let me give you until tomorrow if you know that he just needs to sleep it off or she just needs to you know, go on a run or whatever. We're gonna revisit this conversation. I see that you're getting upset. I don't mean to upset you. I just wanna make sure that you're okay. Um, and listen to what your kid has to say. That's the whole point of, of bringing up the conversation, right? Um, you know, sometimes we definitely want to interject our thoughts on what our kiddo is saying, but give them the floor. If they're going to talk, let them talk. And if you don't know how to sort out or kind of sift through what they're saying, that's when you call us or that's when you call your primary care provider and then we can work through that together, okay? But the more that your child talks and the less, the more that you listen, the greater success that you're going to have and the more, you know, the better success that they feel too. Um, and what I want you to do too is making sure that if something big happens in life, their life, your life, whether this is positive or negative, make it a culture to ask about it, right? Something awesome happened. How do you feel about that? How does that make you feel? We're talking about positive emotions, right? Sometimes it's easier to talk about your positive emotions. Um, so that way when something negative happens, it's gonna be hard to talk about those negative emotions, but at least they're kind of used to talking about emotions in general, because it's hard, okay? I want you to pay particular attention or ask more questions if your child has experienced a loss of a loved one, if you and your spouse are going through a separation or a divorce, okay, that can be really hard and confusing. If there's any major transition, new home, new school, um, parents have new work, there's a new family, there's a new baby in the home, you know, anything like that. Any traumatic life experiences at all. COVID is a traumatic life experience, right? Car accidents, tornadoes, um, loss of a friend, a friend moves away. Think about, again, trauma is different for every person. When a toddler stubs their toe, that is very traumatic, right? With an adult, if we lose someone that we loved, our significant other, that is very traumatic. But there's anywhere in between, we can't define anybody else's trauma. So just because it's not traumatic for you doesn't necessarily mean it isn't traumatic or is traumatic for them. So just kind of pay attention to when they're telling you that something is traumatic, then that's traumatic, okay? And we need to help them to kind of sift through it. If we're having difficulties in school, if we're being teased or bullied in school, we need to make sure that we're asking those conversations, let our kid know that we're on a team, and then have a conversation. Um, you know, if he's like, I don't know what else to do, or she's, I don't know what else to do, have a conversation with you, with the teacher that they enjoy. Um, I always say there's someone on your team at school, always. There's gonna be one teacher that you like, even if you hate school, there's one adult figure in that school that you like and attach to that person um, and have mom take, talk to that person because that can be a huge, huge help even if there's just one person that they know that they can go to at school. And what can we do to improve our mental health at home? I cannot stress enough the importance of getting a good night's sleep, okay? We need sleep, I need sleep. If you do not get a good night's sleep and your kids don't get a good night's sleep, we are gonna be angry, we are gonna be irritable, we are gonna be frustrated, we're gonna be impulsive, we are going to be um, quick to throw a tantrum or to um, not do what we wanna do in school. We may fall asleep in school, right? We can look inattentive, we can look sad, we can look dazed when we don't get enough sleep. Sleep is very important. Um, I encourage physical activity, I don't want you guys to go tell your kids to go run a marathon, right? We don't need to go lift weights, we just need to be up, we need to be moving, we need to be off the couch, um, we need to be, I always say, go sweat, dance, have fun, play soccer, um, do something you enjoy doing that's not sitting on the couch watching our screens. Um, provide positive reinforcement at home, right? Something small happens, make a huge deal about it every once in a while, right? Your kid puts their dish in the dishwasher, that just made my entire night, thank you for doing that. You know, those itty bitty small things can make a huge impact on your kid and their overall value of themselves. 
And then connect and enjoy time together as well. Um, you know, trying to find, I read when um, preparing for this, finding 10 minutes for each one of your kids sounds like something that's super simple to do every day, but in your day, it's probably a very, your 10 minutes, you know, all your 10 minutes go by very, very fast. So finding time, whatever that works for you, that's something special between you and your kid um, that you guys can build a relationship on. That's a good tip. And then again, checking in after um, positive and negative experiences. I talk to all of my kiddos, well checks, mental health visits, um, you know, really everybody about the 5210 rule. This is a super easy thing to remember and follow and understand. And if really, when we talk about 5210, really, if you would Google it, you're talking about obesity prevention. Um, but this is something very easy to implement in our own that I think would really help as well with overall mental health, okay? Five is five servings of fruits and vegetables. Try to eat them every day. It's harder than it sounds. We probably all don't do it. Um, but if we're reaching for those fruits and vegetables, we're getting good nutrients, we're helping our brain to develop, we're helping our body to grow. Um, when our body is healthy, there's a mind-body connection, right? When our body is healthy, our brain will benefit from it. Two, two hours or less of screen time. I'm gonna come back to this one. One, one, physical, one hour of physical activity a day. You're up, you're moving, you're sweating, again, don't go tell your kid to run laps in the backyard, right? They're gonna get mad at you, it's never gonna work, and they are gonna hate being active. Essentially what we wanna do, get them off the couch, get them moving, get them um, you know, being physical, being active, find something they like to do. If they are dancers, if they are singers, get them a karaoke machine, make sure they're off the couch when they're doing it, right? But have them up and moving and sweating. And then zero is zero sugary drinks. Lots and 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 lots of water. Um, juice is very common. Pop is very common. Um, there's all kinds of studies out there about red dyes and sugars and artificial sweeteners and its impact on mental health, um, impulsivity, irritability, hyperactivity, those kinds of things. So if we try to increase water, eat our fruits and vegetables, be physically active, we can see a huge, huge you know, improvement in one, obesity prevention, but two, overall physical and mental health as well. So two, two hours of, of screen time is huge. If I would do a study, which I haven't done a study, right? This is just kind of recall of all of the teenagers that come into my office, well check or um, mental health checks, and I ask them to go on their phone and tell me the number of hours that they've been on their phone that day. Again, I work from eight to the five, right? That day, if I have a patient at three o'clock, I bet they're on their, app, on their phone for eight or nine hours, which I just don't understand, right? Where, where did you sleep? I, like, how, how is this possible? On app, then they check their average. I, most of those kids are averaging at least 10 hours a day on their phone. They're taking their phones into the shower, they are taking their phones to bed with them, they're on their phones all, all night long, really, up until they try to fall asleep. Um, and then they can't fall asleep because their brains are so stimulated because they're on their screens. Technology is amazing. It's wonderful. It has given us so many outlets and, and knowledge and all of those things, but, but they're an addiction too, okay? A lot of the conversations that I have with my parents who come into the office, we're talking about anger and irritability, we're having arguments, and I tell them to turn their screens off and it's just this major meltdown. You don't love me anymore. Da, 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 da. Screens are a trigger, and removing those screens, um, you know, we're trying to tell your kiddo who is addicted in the middle of this video game to turn off that screen can turn into a huge, huge blow up, a huge argument. Um, I set out packets, or I don't know, Angie printed off for me packets, they are called media um, screen contracts. One is a sample contract, the other is a blank contract. I and I would encourage that you go home and talk to every one of your children individually or together as a family and say screens are great, right? And they are there for a purpose. They are there to use for knowledge and for power, right? You have to do your homework. If you're on a computer doing your homework, you have to do your homework, right? Um, but we should not be on our screens all day, every day. If we're on our screens for 12 hours a day, where what are we? What else are we doing? Right? And where are you at school? If you're on your phone for 12 hours a day, what are you doing at school? And why are we behind, right? Um, so trying to come up with limits. Um, you can have your phone if we do this, this, and this. You can have a tablet if we do this, this, and this. You can have your tablet in these circumstances, right? But they will be turned off at the supper table when we eat dinner together. They will be charging in mom and dad's room or in the kitchen. 
no kid needs a phone in their bedroom and they don't need a TV in their room either. Those things are very, very stimulating and we wanna make that room for sleeping. Um, our brains need time to shut down after being stimulated. Screens are very stimulating. If you would come to me and say, my kid is having a hard time falling asleep, the number, very first question I'm gonna ask you is do we have a cell phone or a TV in their bedroom? Um, and if that's the case, the very first thing that I recommend before I would even discuss any medication or diet changes is to remove those things from their bedroom, okay? Screens are very stimulating and they can be triggering as well. Um, so, you know, read through those contracts. They're super simple. Um, we just don't really think about making something like that in our home because we're like, we can figure it out, right? They'll turn them off when I ask you to turn them off. But for kids, they thrive on structure, consistency, and expectation. If they see something in front of them, if this is smacked right front in their refrigerator, right? And you guys say, okay, time to turn off your phone. And they say, oh, I don't want to turn off my phone. You point to the refrigerator and you say, you sign this contract. I sign the contract, right? And I can take that away from you because one, I pay for it. And two, I pay for the electric to charge it. So I'm in charge of these things, right? So screens are huge. Um, you know, they're huge as far as our physical activity. Um, they can get in the way of that, but also, also our mental health. There can be a whole nother talk on social media and the things that we see on social media that we just don't have enough time for today, right? And I think you guys kind of addressed that a little bit um, at the last care of you. But you know, the things that we read and the things that we see on social media as well when we're on them for 12 hours a day can be detrimental to our mental health. Um, these kids are seeing these perfect snapshots and these Instagram pictures of what this other kid has. And that's all that they know, right? They don't see every all the background. They don't see the other bad things that that kid is going through. Um, so then that singles me out and it doesn't make me feel good about myself. Um, so social media can be a definite hit to our own mental health. Okay, so really in conclusion, um, you know, I just want you guys to kind of know if you're having a concern, you some of the things that I talked about, some of the symptoms that we talked about, um, you're like, my kid, you know, that worries me. I've had this thought, but I thought I was crazy, right? You're not. Have a conversation um, and have those conversations with your child. Voice your concerns with your child. It's really important to keep your yearly well checks, okay? It's easy to get away from that, um, but we do screening tools all this every well check that you come into the office, you know, from a young age until you're a teenager and you leave to go into adulthood. We're screening your mental health um, on paper and then I'm also asking the question, right? So sometimes some of the things that are put down on this paper, parents are flabbergasted that that was even, they had no idea that we were dealing with that. Um, so it's really important, your yearly well checks are not just for your physical health, right? It's definitely for our mental health too. Um, again, voice your concerns, be open and honest with your child if you have one. Promoting your healthy diet and lifestyle um, provides structure and consistency. Your child wants to know what to expect from you, right? If your child is always pushing, 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 and you just say, fine, whatever, do what you want, we're going to continue to push, 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 and push with hope with the results that, fine, I can do whatever I want, right? But your child also is going to get mad at you whenever you are strict with your rules, right? But if they know, you know what, mom and dad need business when they say this, we might be more receptive because we're never gonna get away with it, right? Um, so, but structure and consistency, expectation. I know that you can do this and I expect you to do this. Um, you know, those are great conversations to have with your, with your child. And provide love and reassurance to your kiddos, even when they're driving you crazy, right? You know that they made a terrible choice or decision. Have that conversation. Let them know, yes, I'm disappointed, right? But I still love you and I still care about you. And that's why I'm so upset. Um, whether this is positive life situations or negative life circumstances, right? Always let them know, I am here for you. I'm proud of you. We can make better choices. We can learn from this, right? Or that was awesome. I am so excited. Your grades are great. You know, you're doing great. I'm so proud of you, right? Those are very small. We don't have to kind of really go into big, big detail, but those small little things that we can say on a day-to-day -day basis can make them a huge impact. Um, and again, if you have concern, we are, if you don't have a primary care provider for your kiddo, Call us at Wilson, we're happy to hear from you, okay? We're happy to see you, everybody here is um, accepting new patients. If you have a primary care provider and you have a concern, go to them, okay? That's what they are there for. Um, and especially here in, you know, in Sydney, there's great providers and there's a lot of people who are practicing or getting more mental health into their programs, um, into their workspace. Um, 
myself, Lindsay, and Abby are the nurse practitioners, and Dr. McGowan, and we are all very well versed in um, pediatric and mental health. Lindsay does what's called the COPE program, which is a really, really well accepted program by our teenagers. Um, it's a cognitive behavioral therapy approach to helping kids change negative ways of thinking, um, which can be really associated and helpful with anxiety and depression. So if we're constantly having you know, negative thoughts, it's easy for that snowball to turn into a boulder, okay? One small negative thought can really turn into a big boulder very, very quickly. Um, so COPE is a great program. And Abby and Lynn, or Abby and myself are both um, dual certified pediatric mental health. And again, this is just where I've gotten most of my information and grades and graphs from today. So I thank you guys for having me. Thanks for sitting through this conversation today. And if you would have any questions or want to have anything from me specifically, I'm happy to hang around. Um, and I just encourage you guys, if you have concerns, say something. And if you don't know what to do with the response that you get, um, call your health care provider. That's what they're there for. And mental health is a big part of our overall health for our kiddos. So it can definitely be addressed locally, um, you know, with your primary care physician. Thank you. She did reference the handouts. If you did not grab them on your way in, they are at the snack table. So please grab those on the way out if you need to get a copy. Um, they had the 5210 pamphlet she referenced and then the uh, child's media plan and that contract, which I'm going to go make a copy for every member in my household, including my husband, because I think we would all need to sign that. So um, thank you for all that information. Sure. Appreciate it. And um, one of the, I guess, golden nuggets that I'm taking away tonight, there's no silly question to ask your kids in any way, at, at any age. Um, they're going through so many weird things now that I don't think there is a silly question to ask because you might not get that silly answer back. It might be something that you're wanting to hear from them. And that just really helps me put that together. So thank you. Um, to kind of close for the evening, we do have a raffle basket, and um, Reese Insurance donated a $50 Mojitos gift card for tonight. So the conversations that you do have with your family, hopefully this helps um, with that over dinner for family time. Your raffle ticket, um, hopefully you have that still. We'll draw for that shortly. Um, thank you again for being here, and uh, please make sure you do take those handouts. Um, if we could, please give Katie another round of applause for being here tonight and spending your time with us. Our next parent you is actually next Tuesday, which is crazy. It's already April. Um, April 5th will be Family Life Positive Parenting Skills, and that is going to be with Michelle Gibson with um, Catholic Social Services. And she is putting on a, um, it'll be a presentation, but she's also going to have a little more interactive um, group activity as well. She thrives with engagement and communication. So I, I'm really excited. Hopefully you guys can be here next Tuesday. Um, just the initial conversation I had with her, I think you'll really enjoy the topics. All right, Katie, you could draw. Sure. All right, ticket number 238040. Yeah, we have a winner. <laughs> awesome. All right. Uh, be careful going home. Thank you for being here tonight. And if you do have questions, um, Katie is available. Or if you need something um, school related, myself, um, Denny, we're here to help. Thank you. Thank you. There you go. <laughs> Thank you for being here. Kate, were you on a uh, conference call with school staff? Yeah, okay. It wasn't me. Okay, somebody else is working on it. Oh, okay. 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 You just look like who it was. I don't know what you said. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, that's I, good. I, further approval, no help for me. No. Oh, I don't know. It's a, it's a program for to teach kids. Hi. Okay. I, I I'm going to start the school.